Dear students, today we're going to look at the cyclicality of the markets. It's an important part because it lets you know about leading and lagging indicators. And that's something that like macroeconomic uh, forecasters is using to figure out where we're three. heading and where we've been and I'm how are we doing and do we need any changes and policies and stuff like that. So focus on that in this class, in this lecture, on this video, and uh, see you in a moment. Okay, see ya. This video will cover cyclical industries. The cyclicality of industry relates to the sensitivity to the business cycle of the economy. The revenues from the industry is generally high during economic prosperity and expansions. All industries have a different sensitivity to the cyclicality of the overall economy. Sometimes non-cyclical stocks are called defensive stocks. They're generally uh, very essential uh, when it comes to your day-to-day -day needs, like food, soap, staples, and stuff that you would buy regardless if it's an economic expansion or if it's a recession. Some industries that are very sensitive to an economic boom would be those that require large investments. And that's where you have like cement, steel, construction, capital goods, and others that might be very uh, cyclical and uh, profit from a, a booming economy. When investors on Wall Street talk about where they're putting money at risk, they often talk about the cyclicality of different sectors, and sometimes they say they do a sector rotation. What that means is that if you have an economic expansion where they were actually owning materials and industrials and energy and maybe telecommunications, they might rotate out of this these sectors and move it into more defensive investments in the healthcare staples and utilities sectors. Now, as the economy turns around uh, from a recession, they would then rotate again out of um, uh, the defensive stocks into financials, technology, and discretionary and materials uh, as we move in to the future expansion. Now, depending on where we are in the economy and what stage of production things are, you have a new product, maturing product, and standardized uh, product. So in the beginning, when you have something really new, we might not export so much. But as a business gets more and more efficient in uh, production, they might end up uh, selling uh, lots. And that means that they uh, need to export some of this overproduction. And then as um, production decreases, this um, and things are standardized as a nation we would then import so it has to do with consumption this is our consumption line and this is our production line so the product life cycle follows along with the cyclicality of a business now naturally new products is more exciting and typically uh, they're more expensive they're new and uh, there's haves and haves nots. And once it becomes more uh, standardized in production and more people enter the market doing similar products, then it becomes uh, more available. And then as people lose interest, sales decline. So here we have the introduction of a new product. Okay, So the cost of uh, uh, research and development is high. And typically, the profits are low at the same time. And then when we move into uh, as things are growing, pe more people are consuming it, pe more people are having strong like wants and needs, and then it matures, and um, uh, sales peaks, and then sales decline. Okay, this is for um, typically, you know, fun, exciting new products that might uh, go out of fashion at some point. Now, when it comes to consumption, every nation needs a strong middle class. The middle class is the ones that consume the most in the economy. From a macro point of view, 
every nation state needs a strong middle class because they are the ones that get work done. Um, so in emerging markets, there are very few uh, strong segments. And in a new growth market, there's a lot of strong core middle class um, uh, individuals that help uh, consumption in that middle market. Now in mature markets, um, it's more on the one-on-one -on -one marketing. Now all of this is changing with the internet and how all these different apps can actually target us and figure out that we have a cat or a dog at home, teenagers and whatnot, and, and then target every app from Instagram, Facebook to anytime you log into Amazon, they will target you on more one-to-one -one tailored advertisement. Now, a big part here is you have the mass market and the niche market. So the mass market might be your simple vehicles, uh, blue jeans and stuff like that. The niche market might be your Ferraris and uh, your um, tailor-made for you only outfits. Now, a very important part to pay attention to is that the consumption line is typically very steady. What makes it fluctuate up and down is whether or not consumers have credit available to increase their sales but it, or you know, purchases. Now, if people have a credit card and it's not uh, maxed out, mean that means that they can then consume more of stuff that they otherwise couldn't do. However, they borrow money from their future. That causes cyclicalities. Uh, likewise, when there's uh, lots of production, you get exports and other people can consume. Um, and as soon as uh, uh, production decreases, you need to Im import to make up for that. So a large part of the cyclicality here does not only have to do with whether or not people have credit to uh, buy uh, stuff that you might not be able to afford right now, but it also has to do with um, uh, whether or not the exchange rate makes it cheaper to import versus export. In less developed countries, consumption is a m much more sensitive part of the economy. And that's why it's much better to help them develop and become stronger and have a more stable consumption line. Now, how does these cycles impact investments? Well, uh, once you peak and you peak your exports, but at some point it becomes more affordable to actually move production. And that's why US firms develop new products in the developing world for that domestic market. It might not have all the bells and whistles, but it works perfectly for their target customer. And that means that foreign direct investment takes place. That means that they take cash and a bunch of know-how, go to a country and say, hey, we want to build a factory here and we want to hire local people. And especially when things that are going to be produced is not that complicated to make. And the skills levels are not that high. As soon as a country increases their skills, then it also makes sense to outsource some of the research and development to other countries. And because the likes, wants, and needs in different countries are different, inherently different, uh, it makes sense to do foreign direct investments and create research centers around the world to capture the different ideas that different cultures have. As an example of average annual foreign direct investments in billions of U.S. dollars uh, between 1999 and 2004, now these are old numbers, but it's still relevant to see how things are working. So, and here we got uh, Germany, France, uh, where they were having large amount of outflows, okay, that flowed out somewhere else. And look at China. They had lots of inflows of money, okay? That is how a country like China went from uh, rags to riches overnight. Now, investing across borders have different names. 
and it depends on how it's actually done. So one common one is a cross-border mergers or acquiring a business. Sometimes it's not really fond upon uh, that you, uh, business is being sold to a foreign entity. So and instead, we will engage in a greenfield investment, building new facilities from the ground up in a new, a new country of, um, uh, from the perspective of that multinational corporation. And once they've done that, then they might be uh, more open to, in that foreign country, to have investments and buying know-how and abilities and factories and stuff like that. Um, so... Foreign direct investment in the form of greenfield investments typically very welcome. Cross-border acquisition is often very unwelcome. So it's a fine line how you deal with the relationships of the countries that you go and do business in. So why do people and businesses invest overseas? Well, one is to get around trade barriers. If there's a huge trade barrier, it's much easier to build a factory in that country, and that way you don't have to deal with that trade barrier. Another part could be the labor market, that there's imperfections. It might be too expensive, so it's easier to just go somewhere else where the flexibility of hiring and firing people is easy. Another part are intangible assets, or vertical integration. And also, uh, when you deal with the product life cycle, where you want to move something that once was very complicated to uh, manufacture and had to be done in a high-tech area, now can then be outsourced to a lower-skilled uh, place. Another part is that when it has, uh, when a company has overseas investments, you have a lower risk because you're diversifying your production, your customers, and everything else on a global basis. And it typically doesn't mean that the whole world goes to hell in a handbasket at the same time. There's cyclicalities that count, counter work against the uh, cyclicality of a, one state versus another. Because government's actions lead to market imperfections, you have tariffs, you have quotas, you have other restrictions that make it really challenging to have a free flow of good services and people, and sometimes even money. And sometimes you have really high uh, trade barriers that arise naturally due to high transportation costs, particularly for low value weighted goods. Here's an example with some numbers about labor market imperfections. The United States is index 100. So we're comparing against the United States. And here we can see from 97 to 2015 and 16 that the cost of hiring people were very expensive in Switzerland. Okay, so $60 compared to $39 uh, for the United States. Okay, so if you look at uh, Switzerland, uh, Norway, Belgium, Denmark, Germany, Sweden, Austria, they're all Germanic cultures, and they're typically very expensive to hire people in. Now, their scale level are, on the other hand, very high. Schools are very uh, well uh, done. Educational levels are high. Most places of work has some sort of... Uh, apprenticeship that lasts for several years that causes uh, not, uh, the, everything to become more expensive. You take someone that's well educated, you train them over several years until they become a master craftsman and that part costs money. However, if you want low standard deviation in your production, you might want to allocate your production to countries like that. Now, political risk is always the biggest risk when it comes to investing outside uh, your own home country. Now, the question is, does the foreign government uphold the rule of law? You never know. And the important question is typically, what is the risk that things will change? So that means that some of these contracts and negotiations are not enforceable. So what do you do with these political risks? Once uh, thing is you can do is you can add a transfer risk where you have the uncertainty regarding cross-border flows of capital 
Uh, another part is that you have operational risk, and certainly regarding the host country's policy on a firm's operations. A control risk, the uncertainty regarding expropriation. They might just take your stuff, take it over. The host country's political and governmental system might be vague. It might uh, the, the legal system might not exist there in a way that it protects you and your investment. As a result, uh, there's typically very violent and quick political changes in these countries. The track record might be less than really brilliant. Now, in order to do investments overseas sometimes, uh, we need to protect that. And hedging these political risks and aligning it with some of the U.S. policies, uh, we have a organization that helps with that transfer risk. And it's called the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPIC, which is a U.S. governmental federally owned organization. And they offer insurance against um, the inconvertibility of foreign currencies, the expropriation of U.S. owned assets, the destruction of U.S. owned physical properties due to war, revolution, and other violent uprisings. Another one might simply be the loss of business income due to political instability. Dear students, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give me a and like the page. That way, all of these followers like you will get the latest and greatest of my uploads. Not only that, at some point, you can help me help you by having a much nicer URL by instead of having that really weird one that you can't really remember anyway. Uh, so if you do that, I will be really, really thankful. And I'm here for you, okay? So help me help you do better in life. Thank you very much.